Our next session, uh, which is called storytelling, living, playing, learning, experimenting, and um, I'm happy to introduce you. Mm, he disappeared. Okay. <laughs> Uri Aviv, uh, James Robbins Early, Jeff Barry, and John Heinsen. And this session will be moderated by Domenico Laporta. Stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, well, quite an introduction indeed. Um, you guys should teach the old blacks how to sing. Um, my name is Domenico Laporta. I'm a journalist, but um, I'm also heading a um, transmedia new media fund in Belgium called Walimage Creative. And uh, on that respect, uh, I know quite a lot about digital, but I didn't know those people, not all of them, before. And this is because this panel has this uh, exceptional quality of mixing people that probably you won't hear talking to each other again uh, in the same panel. Um, we will focus on storytelling, but uh, as you will see, and they will all introduce themselves, um, they are not coming all from the storytelling uh, world. Uh, so. So that it's clear to the audience, can you please all introduce yourself? We'll start with you, Huri. Hello. Hello, Talen. Uh, it's my first time here. I'm very excited. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Um, my name is Uri Aviv. Um, I'm a festival director. I'm a programmer. I'm an artistic consultant. And I'm a science fiction evangelist. Uh, which means... <laughs> uh, first and foremost, I run a film festival in Tel Aviv, which is in three weeks' time, and I'm excited about that as well, um, which is called Utopia. It's uh, the Tel Aviv International Fantastic Film Festival. It's both fantastic and it deals with the fantastic genres. And uh, what we do is we also utilize science fiction during the festival on, in a program called Science Imagination and Future Visions, where we talk a lot about um, the interplay between science and science fiction. And being a film festival, we're also giving um, um, major um, major discussion um, uh, place uh, for the role uh, science fiction has in media and uh, a lot about we talk a lot about media innovation and how technology has a lot to uh, is a force to do with that the other thing i do is uh, as a as a as a programmer and consultant i do a lot to, with us with um, media innovation and digital innovation i've recently um, um, curated a program for the uh, Frankfurt Biennial of Moving Image about digital innovation. So that's me in a very, very nutshell. Thank you, not me really nutshell. Thank you. Hi, I'm James Early. Um, I, uh, this is also my first time in Tallinn, it's gorgeous here. Um, I just flew in from Los Angeles where I work at ICM Partners, which is a talent agency. Um, I work with writers and directors and, sh and show creators and filmmakers, um, but in, in addition to that, um, I'm a part of a digital group within the company, um, and we, we are increasingly interested in packaging shows for digital platforms and work very close with our filmmakers um, to, to see what available funding there is and new available platforms there is. So I think uh, without wasting too much time um, on an introduction about me, I, I'll mostly be fielding questions about the types of opportunities where stories can go um, and the types of forms that those stories are taking shape in before they go out to new platforms. Uh, my name is Jeff Barry. I work with James at ICM Partners. Um, I also work with filmmakers and actors and writers um, my focus seems to be really in, in the international space. I work with a lot, with a lot of European filmmakers. Um, this is my third time to Tallinn. We were here two years ago together. Um, I think it's a great festival. It's on the cutting edge of combining storytelling with technology. And um, the people who organize the festival are terrific. And I just think this year, I've noticed a, a sort of an increase in the amount of attention press the, the festival is getting. And I think that it's a testament to the people behind it and the fact that this is a growing market it's getting great films, and I'm honored to be back. So. 
Hi everyone, I'm John Heinsen. Uh, this is my third time in town. Very happy to be here. I'm, uh, uh, I'm a producer. My company is called Bunny Graph Entertainment. It's a multi-platform company uh, working in everything from film and TV. After a 10-year career in traditional television, I uh, got into digital in 2005. And so for the last 10 years, I've been very uh, on the kind of forward edge of what is happening in digital. Uh, for three years, I was the digital showrunner for the Academy Awards for ABC. And I'm the vice president of new media at the Producers Guild of America. And I'm a new e-resident of Estonia. So I'm very happy to be here. Okay, let's start with you, John. Uh, you just mentioned that you are with the New Media uh, Producers Guild. Uh, this is something that is quite unique. Having a, It also exists in France. There's an association of producers, uh, and it must exist also in different other countries. But what are you doing? What, what do you need that the Producers Guild needed a new branch, especially for uh, digital producers? Sure. So the, new, uh, the Producers Guild is an association of 7,000 film, TV, and new media producers in America, in North America. Uh, we also have an international uh, committee that has associations with different organizations around the world, including the, the French Producers Guild and whatnot. Um, the, the New Media Council of the Producers Guild is only 10 years old. Um, and the Producers Guild as an organization has grown immensely. In the year 2000, there were only 350 members. Now there are 7,000. So it really has become a mainstream professional organization. It's not a union, it's a trade association. So what has happened and what I've focused on in my tenure um, coming into the New Media Council from the multi-platform space is really about evangelizing to the traditional film and TV producers within our organization about the new opportunities in digital and about understanding what new opportunities it has for producers. So that most of my evangelism is done within the organization itself. So we'll, we'll create opportunities with other associations. Okay, um, let's use the right word. I mean, sure. when you say opportunity, is it money? Because there's a lot of questions about the fact that sure. there are no business models sure. and stuff like that. Sure, we'll do showcases of projects and talk about how they got their funding. We'll often partner with the Television Academy to showcase some of the Emmy-nominated projects, which very often are in the multi-platform space, second screen space, things of that nature. It's about uh, understanding how to collaborate with other organizations like the Screen Actors Guild and things like that to figure out how to get budgets down and things of that nature. So it's really, it's, mostly it's about creative the creative conversation more than the, the monetizing. A lot of times that we have members that are working on big TV shows, and what's happening now and, and what's actually been the case is that very often a lot of this digital content that's associated with film and TV shows is uh, controlled from the marketing departments within these companies. And the companies are very siloed, so there's a disconnect between the creative team and the people creating the digital content. And so that's the thing we're really trying to, to break up within the Producers Guild. It's all about spending production dollars up front instead of marketing dollars under, after the fact. But the studios are going to have a problem with that because it takes away head, uh, headcount and budget for marketing. So this is the thing we're really trying to shift. And you can see out in the marketplace, producers like Tim Kring and whatnot, Andy Zuki are the ones that are able to take that budget and actually drive the creative. And that's where you're seeing the real innovation. So it's about showcasing showrunners that are having that kind of experience and success. At ICM, are you analyzing that? I mean, what is your role in uh, all that process in connecting different industries together and uh, having them work on the same, for example, franchise? I think it's really important to distinguish what is new media in, because I think new media is increasingly, in our eyes, becoming traditional media. And I think what new media was a little while ago with their uh, platforms like Netflix, pl platforms like Amazon, Hulu, um, that were thought of as new media, and now we kind of just refer to them as streaming. Um, yeah, but new media is actually what it means, new media. There's always new it, media. Every day new medias are But uh, from, our, from our vantage point, when we look at, when, we, when a writer goes out with an idea, um, in terms of what a deal looks like, in, ter in terms of how you make money on a back end, in terms of how you make money up front for writing something, there would be, you know, however many, 38 cable networks in, in America, however many broadcast. Um, and now, in, and now we're, we, there was siloed this extra thing of streaming devices. And now we really just categorize streaming um, into this bundle of cable networks. They're just they're just they're not bundled within uh, you know a, a, a cable provider, but they're they're one one off, and I think increasingly going to be one off. And so we don't necessarily see the distinction between those streaming devices, which are new media. I think one step further to that is that there's a lot of new platforms that are coming out of, <clears throat> coming out of um, let's call it a YouTube space or, so, or, or, or platforms that are um, 
typically short form videos. Um, and what, what they're capitalizing on are hu very large networks of followers and subscribers. So Awesomeness TV, for example, started out as a YouTube network, was bought by the Hearst Foundation, then bought by DreamWorks for $500 million. They have, they have a, a subscriber base something to the tune of 80 million. And most of their subscriber base is, um, are teens. And so they will pay competitively um, for, their, for content that falls to their demographic and, um, and save on marketing costs and be able to have Im embedded content or even, even better yet, use some of their YouTube stars in, in place in their, in their original content that they're making. And, in, and it's all worked into a network of monetizing a viewership of a built-in audience of 80 million people. So it's not necessarily, we don't necessarily view what a lot of people view as new media, which are these new streaming devices. What we kind of see as the next wave are, are all these um, pools of subscribers that are able, you're able to monetize by either branded content or advertising in some capacity. And a very competitive levels of funding are coming in because the advertising dollars are so strong. So it's really where it, it, we, we break apart our mind, new media basis, ba, ba, like where the money is coming from. Traditional is selling advertising off of cable, and then there's a subscription model, which is a lot of the, the streaming advertising, and then there's one step further, which is return to advertising, which is out of this pool. So it's, it's all. One thing to comment about that is that um, if you're talking about television shows and, and scripted TV, the, the top of the line, the goal is network scripted television. Because if you're a showrunner, if you're an agent, if you're representing one of these creators, that's where you're gonna derive the most money, best syndication potential. Cable is a little bit more difficult. You're seeing less dollars coming through. Um, with Netflix, Hulu, you don't know what those back ends are yet. With Netflix and Hulu, you don't necessarily, you can't calculate what those back ends are. Netflix doesn't necessarily print you a quarterly report of how many subscribers watched your show and what that means in terms of you know, money coming into them. So um, as, as agents, we have to be on the cutting edge um, and be aggressive in establishing these deals uh, up front. For example, um, a, a new company, a new distributor out there in the new media space is Amazon um, in, their, in, their, in their streaming service. We had the, for our client had the first um, Amazon released film, uh, Spike, Spike Lee, with Chirac. Um, and it was a deal that we put together um, and it was based on a creative match um, between Spike, what he wanted, to, the story he wanted to tell, and what Amazon wanted to do, and also their commitment theatrically and how many theaters they would guarantee us, as well as how quickly the secondary VOD market on Amazon would would, would kind of would happen. Um, so it, it's you know we were the first agency to negotiate an Amazon deal, which is exciting, um, and uh, you don't want to have to eventually go back and, and renegotiate it later on down the line if you don't ask for it up front. Yeah, but in a way, it's the same content. I mean, it's the same stories told across multiple platforms. We're talking multimedia. We're not talking transmedia or, or cross-media here. So what, what I'm asking is, that are they, is there a new generation of storytellers? And are they given the space to actually have the same deals, negotiate with those platforms on the same level? You were mentioning Spike Lee, but Spike Lee is an old director. He is a digital immigrant. Um, so a veteran uh, immigrant. So uh, how, are you, how are you dealing with, with this new generation of storytellers? What, what are the, the opportunities for them? Well, for them, if we're a new, the next generation, it's an opportunity to get their story told. You know, in, in terms of the film landscape, there's fewer distribution you know, opportunities. The studios are making fewer movies. movies. A movie that a new filmmaker might make is now, that would, you know, five, ten years ago, be released by Paramount, is now struggling to find that theatrical audience. So you're going to have to either raise the money, you know, financing independently, um, which is tough to do if you're an American writer, director. We don't have incentives or soft money like you do here. Um, and so you, take it to, you can take it to Amazon, you can take it to YouTube. I mean, you could probably talk about this more than I can because you, you're in the digital side of things. I think the biggest thing in terms of actual storytelling of how writers is it's, there are increasingly amount, a large amount of platforms. Right now in, in the States, there's something to the tune of 430 series, scripted ser original series on the air right now. And if you're a, and there's the other thing that's really changed is for these streaming services, they want binge watching. And so in terms of actual storytelling, it's much more, it's much more advantageous instead of to have a procedural or this through line where people have to, you know, or people can tune in season episode five, season three or whatever and, and still feel comfortable watching a single show. 
Um, the narrative of all these streaming shows are such that they're really one storyline all the way through. And they're, they're not as bound, because there's not advertising attached, and they're not as bound to being 22 minutes long and eight minutes of advertising around these things. So you have comedies that are an hour long, like Orange is the New So Black. what you're saying is that it always has been like that, that technology is influencing storytelling. This panel is called Storytelling 2.0, but actually it's, we are past more uh, to, uh, we're probably 2,000 ways of uh, storytelling <laughs> because technology has been evolving all the time. I was just want because Uri wanted to comment on that, he hasn't spoken yet. Um, yeah, here is the microphone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to be a little bit abstract, uh, more abstract and philosophical. I'm hearing your discussion about um, new media, um, and I, I think you, you'll um, you'll agree with me as as the reason that new media deserves and needs an evangelical an evangelical force because um, we don't really know what new media is or it's completely changing all the time. I think um, um, looking at the industry and looking at the community around it, we're in the uh, phase of new media. Um, of a train coming into the station, by which I mean the first film. Okay, we, we don't need, really know where it goes. Does it go in a circus, this 15-second this film? I mean, in, in what kind of platform do we package it? Or do we put it in an opera house, which were, you know, prominent locations for entertainment in, back in the late 19th century? Or do we put it in a variety show? And we don't really know how to fully monetize on it, and we don't really know even what it is. So, and, and we're also not really, we're becoming more and more eloquent with the language that it affords, but we've not really seen, and well, there are a lot of um, um, applications of VR and AR and, and, yeah, and so it. forth. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that, because language is obviously important in storytelling. This is the way you communicate your story, and uh, films has, has been, you told, uh, as that, that it has been packaged. So the language might seem the same now in every film, except it's not. There are nuances, there are dialects that are spoken in action films that are not the same dialects that are spoken in, in drama or art house films. But we're facing now new technologies like VR, and there's a way to write uh, for VR. It's just not completely freedom. Uh, you're, you don't put that helmet and you're completely free. It's not that. So. Um, who are those no new storytellers? Where are they? How do you uh, how do you deal with them? And um, yes, John. So it's so it's so it's really exciting. And what the real opportunity is is that this new digital space that we're hopefully all going to thrive in. Right, that's the whole idea here. Is it's a convergence of three things in the world today: traditional media as we know it, branded advertising, and social media, and technology. And technology is the last mile because technology is always in motion. So as storytellers, we have to be, we have to be flexible uh, to that technology as it applies to our story. And the new value proposition in the digital space, like we've spoken here before, is the idea of community. So the content you create has to spark a conversation and build that community, that word of mouth. The audience does the heavy lifting. And what's really great is, is this notion that since marketing at the studios has traditionally been the one that's raised um, the visibility by reaching the audience, now it's the audience themselves. So it's having these platforms that allow storytellers to get in front of these audiences, and it empowers them to spread that word of mouth. And so it's a very exciting time in that regard because it allows people, especially in those niche areas, to target those specific audiences and to have them become those big evangelists to help share your story and build community around it. When Disney bought Banker Studios for $500 million last year, it wasn't because of the shows that they had. It was because the community that they had the reach. And that reach is what's so valuable in this day and age. And also, I think that, because uh, you were talking about who these storytellers are, I equate the digital space today like early television. When television first started in North America, we had the people coming into it from vaudeville. We had the stage people. We had the radio people, Bob Hope and people like that. And so now what's happened is, is that all those people came in with their sensibilities from where they came from. And in a matter of time, and as the technology standardized, you had the medium of television. That's exactly what's happening now. And what was started as mobile content and early video content has now become this transmedia play because the studios and the traditional world that we're evolving from is now finding its way across these platforms. And that's the root of what transmedia is. And there's also an interesting loop in the fact that the audience is influenced by films, uh, mostly science fiction. Uh, science fiction has been creating a lot of tech uh, across the years, and the audience is inspired by that, and they try to imitate it, and uh, therefore a lot of devices are created only because they started in films. So this is like really what you're specialized in. Can you comment well, about I'll, that? I'll give a little comment about that, because, um, because I'm here both as, 
as well as a science fiction evangelist. Um, well, science fiction has a has is a source of inspiration for a lot of people, um, but I see it I see it in a number of ways. One of them is um, the science fiction notion of um, being able to describe or visualize visually articulate something that is not in existence yet, and that's a great philosophical and creative um, challenge that has been uh, with cinema and with film and with media since the early beginnings, since, since George Milius, and um, has been going on for, for, you know, ever since. And that both enables um, creatives in the film industry and, and outside of the film industry, designers, concept artists, to um, delve into um, uh, creative depths that otherwise would not be, and um, enables them to visualize things that are not there yet, things that are not in existence. And that's both a, a creative challenge and a technical challenge that kind of um, um, continuously uh, evolves the technical fields in the film industry and, and um, evolves the film industry itself. Well, we, we are witnessing more and more technologies that um, are becoming, are, are, are um, sorry, my English is not, it's not my first language, sorry about that. So it's, um, so we're seeing a lot of technologies coming in um, through that. And I'll make another more philosophical point in that um, describing and visually articulating and articulating um, um, new and innovative and not be foreseen concepts is more than just um, a, a creative um, challenge. It's a civic society endeavor. It's important to do because it um, expands our thought process, it expands our, our imagination, and it enables us to, um, and it, to do everything. It, um, crazy people do uh, films, and that enables other crazy people to do other things as well. So that's kind of my prospects on that. Let me talk about one practical example. You asked a question earlier about how a new creative, a new young writer, director can inv get involved and break through the digital space or the VR space. Um, what's Alex Plavager's company's name again? The VR company? I'm, I'm doing a deal for a writer director. This guy has done a, sh a couple short films, have gone to Sundance, played really well in Sundance, won awards, and he's got a feature that we're helping him put together and cast and raise financing for, and he's also got a great VR project. It's about 30 pages, it's a horror, a horror idea um, about a bunch of Boy Scouts who suddenly turn into zombies. And you witness your, your body becoming sort of zombified. And um, we teamed him up with a VR production company who you know, said, we'll give you 150 grand to make, this, to make this. And so we had to basically carve out what that deal is gonna look like for him, you know, what he's gonna get to direct, what he's gonna get to develop the idea and all that kind of stuff. And I found it really interesting. And it's just, I think we let the creative drive it. If it's a strong idea, we let the creative dictate where it's gonna live. Is it gonna be a short film? Is it gonna be a VR experience? Is it gonna be something we wanna build out like Damien Chazelle, who did that short film for uh, Whiplash that ended up being the launch pad for a longer film? You gotta really let the creator and the creative drive it. But um, it's exciting for this young guy who, again, never directed a feature film, who's now gonna have one of the first VR experiences out there. Um, and I feel like our agency is really on the cutting edge of, of making that stuff happen for our clients. And the VR space is completely new. You know, no one really, again, no one really knows what they're doing. A bunch of directors are trying to launch their own production companies in the VR space, but um, it's, uh, it's sort of the Wild West and it's exciting. So if you're a young filmmaker out there and you wanna work, you, you can do it. You just gotta have people who can help you get there and believe in you, and, um, but it, it's exciting. You don't have to be Spike or Tom Hooper or Steven Spielberg. That's, that's what I mean. I mean, there are new opportunities for people that are mastering a new tool that probably all directors are not mastering quite well. Um, but this uh, content is not really gathered in one place. Uh, so far, you have a few stores, but you need a device. Uh, it's not retail yet. It's going to happen just now as yeah. we speak. Samsung is releasing uh, their headset uh, now, I think, this month. Um, but well, the New York Times. And the New York Times, New York Times just gave away however many million units of the cardboard uh, virtual reality thing. So that's obviously going to raise the And they are producing the specific content too for, for, for that device. And it's new. I mean, the New York Times all of a sudden becomes one of the massive VR producers. So it's also changing the way... And think about the New York Times. It's, it's a print newspaper. You know, everybody declared they were going to be dead. 
seven years ago, and now here they are coming out with a VR device that they're giving away for free. You know, that's how, these, how these big media companies have to think nowadays. Um, I sat down uh, about a month ago with, um, with Verse, which is one of the larger uh, VR companies right now, and just in terms, and they, uh, they showed me a bunch of videos that hadn't made it onto their, their app yet, which you can download and, and view through the little New York Times finder, and I'm sure, <clears throat> excuse me, the little cardboard things are not very much to buy if you don't have one or a New York Times subscription, but the types of storytelling that they were doing was, it was mostly filmmaker driven. They have about 15 huge filmmakers. So it's not, there aren't so many writers doing it as there are filmmakers with ideas because it's a very visual experience. This is in the VR so space. So far they're not even filmmakers, they are artists. Uh, someone like Chris Milk is he, not a filmmaker. That's he, correct. He's and, and Chris Milk, so Chris Milk and Patrick um, created Verse and, are, and they're producing all of them, but um, they have Chris, uh, uh, Patrick has a, a, a smuggler, which is a commercial production company. So a lot of the a lot of the um, directors are actually just commercial directors. But some of the stories that they were telling was there was a back concert of someone just sitting on stage. That obviously not a narrative um, narrative story, but there, it was an experience. And as soon as you the camera tells a completely new story than would otherwise be possible. Um, but there were other things that I found very interesting that were that went to a Syrian refugee camp. And 80,000 people, uh, 80, people in a refugee family, it's about a 20 minute video and you put a headset on and walked around and it was a story following these kids playing soccer, learning, uh, uh, learning in the first time in the classrooms of this new it's town. It's called Clouds Over Cedra. Yeah, and so there's new, it's not, there's so many different ways of telling stories because it's so experiential that I think that's the new cusp of VR is putting people in a place that is much more emotive than it is extracting emotion through uh, language or anything, because you're really in there, and I, there, you can't be But in this is what people were saying about cinema, what it appeared. Uh, I, I mean, the first time they saw this film with the train, uh, people they just lay down on the floor because they thought the train was, was hitting them. And, and there's the train effect in this Chris Milk film One, as 100%. well. He used the same effect, actually. So it, it feels like, in a way, Everything is looping, and we are all. It's the theory of uh, pure cinema. I don't know if you know about it, but uh, it's the fact that cinema, since its invention, has been trying to find a way to return to the basics, to a world where there was no cinema, where there was only reality. So the the simple fact of having artifacts like uh, film and CGI's looking real. Uh, until the point that you forget about them. Remember, in the 90s, you wanted to see those CGIs because this was like the, the buzz effect of the film. But now you want everything to be invisible. Yes, Yuri. So I think those are two different um, experiences. We've not even talked about games and gaming. Which is but games have become films as well, in a so way. So I would, I would claim that there, technically there are a lot of similarities and the industry has a lot of um, links and in, in, in betweens. But uh, it's totally, it's two di totally different experiences uh, for the for the for, for for a person. One is getting being told a story where you do not participate. You're just a watcher. You're just listening or ex uh, having the experience um, 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 taken care of by someone else. And there are degrees for that, but you are static. And there are degrees of complexity to that. You can read a novel and you can see a film, and those are very, very different um, uh, types of um, experiences, but they are storytelling. And they can be solitary experiences, like the novel, and you can watch a film communally, so that's a totally different thing. Uh, but still, an, uh, still the same experience. And there's the interactive social experience, which is, once again, different. And... I think that with more leisure time... But what is interactive to you? I mean, if, if I lost my father and I watch a film about the grief and the loss uh, of someone that lost his father, for me it's interactive. I interact with that screen, with the author, with the story. I'll, I'll answer that. It's when you are required to take a decision about where the story is going to end or... So you mean participative? Participative, thank you, yes. So, because uh, sometimes you do not want to... Uh, um, um, you want to be told a story with a moral, with someone else is telling you, what, when someone else is, you know, um, is in charge of the moral, the message. And, and at, some, at other points, you want to participate in building that message. Or, so those are two different things that can coexist and we can be entertained by them, you know, by both, by both of them. 
I, I just want to go back to, I, without missing a point, you made a great analogy of, a couple of people made a great analogy of, of what happened to, when television first started and, and where those people came from. I think the another analogy of what digital platforms are doing is, is kind of what happened in, in music, where all these bands started recording themselves and putting themselves out there, and all these massive labels stopped doing R&D, and they, they basically were just piggybacking off of other people doing all the legwork for them and acquiring. And I think what's happening is a lot of people, uh, from the business side, there's so many different storytellers that are doing something for very little, doing all the work of development on themselves, you know, doing, putting in sweat equity to these web series and whatnot, what isn't a lot of money up front. And what channels and studios are doing are just a, are, are simply acquiring. In, in, um, and so I, I, it's a pattern to watch whether a lot of the series creation happens in a bubble without funding, and then there's a lot of money if you make it into traditional media, and the storytelling gets squeezed into a box that traditional media would otherwise have. And I, I, again, I think you see that time and time again. The foremost example in music is someone like Justin Bieber being just you know plucked up off the internet and 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 put into a commercial box. I think that there's a, increasingly a number of shows um, that ha you know are online. And then all, all of a sudden, have, you know, they get acquired and reformatted, and are now on some cable channel and look exactly like everything else. And the original storytelling was constructed kind of by limited means, kind of by well, it's got you know, you can only put 10-minute videos on YouTube, you can all these things. So I'm interested, looking forward, is to how much this give and take relationship is between people creating new forms of storytelling, but then needing money at some time, and there being a format that you need to adhere to if there's money involved and losing that net new form of storytelling if money doesn't catch up in an original, in it, it, to the original form that, that yes. storytelling John. comes. Yeah. Um, after that, we will open the floor to questions. So if you have questions, please raise your, your hand and we will pass the microphone. So when I first started producing digital content in 2005, everybody said, well, how much is this stuff going to cost, right? And so having come from traditional television, you know, the, the, the real unit of measure is, because there isn't that license fee for digital content, it's really the cost per minute. Because is your digital series 30 seconds or seven minutes, right? That's going to determine how you're going to do it. So if you take an American sitcom at, at 22 minutes at $1.5 million, that's about $67,000 a minute for content. Okay, well, nobody's spending that in the digital space. And in 2005, 2008, they were at most spending $500 a minute for digital content. Today, the ceiling is probably closer to $10,000 a minute. So that's why this digital content um, is obviously uh, has those issues. So when you're out there creating a web series, you've got to find a model that you can replicate, right? Because nobody's buying 100 episodes of a short form series, they're buying 10. So for instance, I did something once that had a one day shoot with a three day post that would yield 20 episodes for $50,000, okay? This is SAG, paying SAG, everything out the door, high production value, shot in high def. So that now I could take that, take those 20 episodes to test wherever they were going to live in the marketplace, and then know that when if someone came back and wanted 10 more episodes, I had a price point that I could replicate. And this is the thing that you have to do, right? So in terms of trying to create, you know, you have these series, series like House of Cards and whatnot that are essentially TV shows that are just now being replicated for streaming and digital platforms. But in terms of the short form content coming up, you have to build those characters that have that, those length of episodes, right? Every piece of IP you develop has to have 100 episodes in it, otherwise it's not gonna work. Because nobody knows yet, does it have to be on every day to get you back? And that's the big thing too, that there really isn't programming yet in the digital space, like you think like television. Okay? But the, when, when you think about the audience, I mean, if you put yourself, your audience yourself, uh, most of the time you want to hear or watch a good story, maybe you want to read it or watch it or hear about it, but you're not choosing between series, film, video game. I mean, all you want is the good story. And this is the only time in history where there are so many ways to have a good story being told. I mean, a video game can be a very effective way of telling a story that a film cannot even grasp. Uh, a film can be the only way to tell a certain type of story or documentary. You, you yeah, I think it's all about premium content. If it's good material, it doesn't matter what medium it lives on. Look at the webs or the um, the radio series, uh, the podcast serial. Do you guys listen to that? Like it revolutionized podcasting and it got people engaged, listening in their cars at home. It became a phenomenon, and that's radio or 
podcasting, I guess, which is the podcasting the next. The, the, yeah, but the, the thing is that they could they could listen to that on their iPhone. They could listen yeah. to that in their car. Technology facilitated the fact that they they didn't have to stay live uh, in front of the radio to to, but it to was actually good. engage with that. It story. was interesting. It was it was provocative, and it got people talking around the water cooler the next morning at at the office. So as long as it's premium content, I mean, we work with and our agency works with some of the best showrunners, creators in the industry. And um, their content will always be king. If you have a new, a new person coming out, breaking out into the marketplace, who just wants to be a showrunner, has, has an idea for a movie, you've got to really make sure it's, it can be the best it can be. It's international, it's appealing, it's global, it's commercial. Um, and otherwise, it, it just, you've got to aim high in terms of the, col the quality of the content. You know? And do you have the impression that the time you spend with characters or the, st the time you spend with a story will influence your appreciation of, of that story. This is why people are playing 300 hours inside a video game. And when it's the end of it, they are, they are feeling this sense of loss. Uh, it's the same with the series. After maybe six or seven seasons, they are missing those characters. But the film, if it's packaged in two hours, um, well, somehow you don't have that sense of immersion. So the film is actually losing ground. Is that, would, you, would you comment on that and think this is something that is happening? Yeah, that's, I think that's a reason I think that it's harder to go to the, the, the box office. I think that there's so many different things competing for attention. Movie tickets are expensive. It's a process. If you have kids, you gotta, you know, you got to go through that whole find a sitter, all that. And Games are also expensive. And what? Games are also expensive. You can, yeah, but you can have $75 for, for a video game, but, and, and you will finish it in, in two or three days. But you're right in the sense that the series keeps paying off. You can follow these characters over a longer period of time. And for us, as talent agents, for our writer or actor clients who may, 10 years ago, a, a big actor may not have wanted to do television. Now they're rushing to TV because the better content creators are playing in that space as opposed to film because it's becoming, film is getting squeezed. So. I think, um, I think what, what all these platforms are doing to traditional, in, in, what you're saying in film, traditional big studio movies is, um, you know, a lot, there's, we hear a lot of questions, there are no good movies anymore, you know, Kramer versus Kramer would not get made today, um, but it pro probably would get made, it would just get made for $5 million and it would be on video on demand and it would make maybe $10 million and make a profit. What, um, what we're seeing at the, at the big studio, how, how all of that model is affecting big studio movies is, um, is it's almost big movie TV, you see big franchises Fast and the Furious is is however many episodes of a huge event, and and every great single, character yeah, development in and, that film. And a, and a, <laughs> and, and a um, almost all the big studios, their prime objective, apart from one or two prestige movies, which they want to do Oscar and award movies and have a run for to market their studio and their brand, they are looking for franchises. Um, and so, in a way, in a way. Um, it's becoming television in a big form too, and it's a, it's making it an event and making it very broad. And where you where you have Sundance movies and independent movies, where the independent market falling out so much funding, and part of that is just because of the marketing costs that go into marketing a film. Now you have to if it if it costs thirty million dollars to market a film, it means you need sixty million dollars gross at the box office just to make up those costs. So it's e much easier to spend $30 million on marketing a movie that's $100 million that you're going to make $260 million off of as opposed to a little $5 million Sundance movie. And with money falling out of independent film like that, all those independent filmmakers are now going to television. So you have shows like Togetherness, Transparent, which are really kind of were independent movies. So I think what, with, it, with the advent of so many uh, more cable outlets and streaming devices and platforms, I think where storytelling has changed is it's the form of independent film that you would have seen in the 90s um, through to about five years ago are suddenly, those voices are suddenly stretching something that looks like Little Miss Sunshine across a whole entire season um, on all these streaming and having the money to support it and the storytelling that reaches across seasons upon seasons. Okay, Yuri will comment if you, if there, yes, there's a question out there, so someone will give you the microphone. Just wait for the comment, and then after that, it will so be up to you. Sec? Just a second. So, um, it's interesting, I think uh, about a year ago, either George Lucas or Steven Spielberg uh, mentioned that they would not be surprised if a film, in a film, uh, that the film would cost, a ticket would cost $50 in a few years' time. And they, I don't, I'm not sure if they refer to it that way, but a film, 
or those types of film are becoming our modern day opera. And, uh, I th and, and another, another thing is that it's, it's difficult to create a film now that could be financially viable if it costs either below 200 million well, um, um, or more than 2 million. And I think one of the most interesting things, because you've mentioned Mark Duplass' series, one of the, one of the most interesting films uh, to see around is the indie platforms, is the indie creators, is the indie creatives, and the, the, the peop types of people and types of projects that are, are uh, materializing in the less than two million, less than one million, then less than five hundred thousand um, dollar budgets, which go on because these are the radicals, these are the um, people who are endeavoring to do something new, something innovative, and hopefully something very creative. And that's that's something to to watch for. Thank you. Yes. Yep. Really a Can you tell us who you are first? Uh, David Traub. I'm an independent producer from uh, the States. Um, very interesting that, that you're, you're, you're interpreting the transition from television, stretching it out over, sorry, from uh, indie films into to, uh, television. It's also going the other way. There are hundreds and hundreds of people now trying to figure out how to, what VR or immersive narrative is going to be. And um, you, you, you stated, Uri, that uh, there's only two kinds of, of films or two kinds of experiences, and, and I'm not, not to paraphrase you, one where uh, the director leads you and you have a suspension of disbelief. Two, two extremes, let's say. Extremes, two, extremes. And the other is you're participatory. And it's interesting to reference the fact that NBC did a study in the mid-'80s that people didn't want to participate uh, with, it's with the It's still the case. People the are lazy. Show. Right, but, but here's the point. You have to remember that NBC, you know are in the non-participatory, right. were in the 1980s, right. non-participatory. Exactly. Uh, so what's business. interesting with immersion is you have a director, an auteur, wanting to take you someplace, and yet you can look around and you have secondary and tertiary uh, you know, distractions. One of the theories I've heard recently is a the theory of narrative magnets, where they're, 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 you have the primary magnet, which is the director's vision, and then you have secondary and tertiary that seem to be picked up by maybe artificial intelligence and physics engines and gaming. Uh, given that what a story really needs is story, character, emotion, where does machine-based storytelling or gaming come in with these guys that are all trying to figure out narrative inside of VR? Where, where does story go when you're also competing or being aided and embedded by all this other area in, in computer intelligence? I don't know if that came out very clearly, but... Where is, where is gaming going when the, the viewer can look anywhere? Or story going when uh, the viewer can look anywhere? Um, I, don't know if I, I don't know if I have the answer to that, but I will say that in my conversations with VR companies, the, pe the producers there are most interested in writer-directors. So people that, can, that are able to write a narrative but also see through their vision and have a strong visual sense as well. So a lot of... and Absolutely. It's t television show... Run the people that, excite, that make their eyebrows go up are all the television showrunners um, of all the hit shows that you know. That's the, that's the number one question. That, you know, we could have someone who is an amazing writer but not a director, amazing director, not a writer, and that's fine, that's great, but it's really, and I actually, I'd even see that in television as well. People, um, increasingly, people believe in, have a, there's less risk, if that's, if that's the case or not, but at least perceived risk in, um, someone who's able to carry through the vision that they had and not pass it on to someone else and have the message missed in between the director and the writer. I think that, um, I think that in television, I, traditionally film has been a filmmaker medium. I think what you're seeing, if, if not with True Detective and a lot of other shows too with David Fincher and, and House of Cards, is that television is becoming a director's medium as well. And it's really shaping the type of television, especially when directors come on to not only set the tone in a pilot, but continue throughout the duration of entire season. You really see that it's it's not it, there's a cinematic element to television now, and I think that um, and I think that increasingly showrunners are directing a lot of the episodes that they're doing, and it's really influencing a solid vision throughout the show and creating a narrative. And increasingly back to your question, it's, it's what all buyers, but a lot of the VR companies that we're talking to, they're looking for showrunners, specifically showrunners that, that have done a lot of directing and a lot of them are, are doing so. But, but, pardon me? 
Absolutely. Um, I think that if you look at a lot of the cable shows, you'll see how many episodes are directed by showrunners or their writing staff. So many of the writing staff are picking up episodes. Um, and there are absolutely, you know, there's the Michelle McLarens of the world that are amazing television directors um, and will we'll in, in, we'll be show creators as well uh, in the sense that they'll develop a show um, and that, you know, I think it takes strong partnerships. I think in, in, if everything is under one house, with a showrunner director, that seems to have more cachet for at least the new media companies because um, it's a consistent it's a consistent vision through one person. But you partially also answered your own question when you were saying where is it all going? Uh, something that is new to VR and that is already happening in video games, replayable. Um, that you can actually live the same story twice, three times, four times because there are always new elements, a new corner uh, to explore or new added content. Or you can also update that content, which is something that is completely new. Uh, a film, you will have the director's cut, for example, it's an updated version of the film. Uh, this is something that is happening in games all the time. They update the content and then you come back to the game because there's new content. And it's the same with VR. So this is a total new door to the future. It's the fact that of course, a lot of people li love a film, they like to rewatch this film again and again, but it's always the same film. Their level of understanding will vary, of course, but uh, the, the film is the same. And with VR, uh, you can actually discover new content every time you play uh, the experience, you live the experience. It's not about watching anymore. For, for video games, I am noticing a lot that it's, it's um, a lot of, it's as many graphic comics writers doing, I mean, we represent graphic novelists as well, and we get, if not more, requests for consulting on video games than we do screenwriters. And their major directors are directing, major, major directors, the Matt Reeves of the world, are directing video game commercials for the Halos. You see that they're, they, they're gamers. It's a major, it's the that. biggest entertainment business. Yeah. I mean, it's bigger than film. Uh, yes, there's a question here, the lady. Uh, yeah, my name is Elizabeth Schoss and I'm a film director from Norway and I find the discussion absolutely fascinating and I'm really curious also about, um, um, Jeff, you mentioned the, the deal that you brokered for Spike uh, about uh, with Amazon and I'm assuming this is under the new leadership of Ted Hope at Amazon and that is actually an example of bringing somebody, well, if you have the analogy of the radio people, this is you know the, the world guru of independent filmmaking taking the lead in a big big company uh, such as Amazon. I think that's a really exciting um, match. And could you talk a little bit about why Amazon decided to guarantee the a theatrical run and how you see the, the sort of new maturity in these big players also uh, realizing that they have to compete on original uh, content? Sure. Well, for, for us, um, it was imperative and it was a deal breaker um, that Amazon would have to release the film in, in, the th in theaters. Um, you look at Netflix and the, the movie they're doing with Brad Pitt uh, or Cary Fukunaga's film, Beast of a Donation, they, the representatives of those, of those creatives made sure the film would be released theatrically to ensure um, a, an Academy campaign. It, it, there's certain qualifications you have to hit. Um, and for us, it was important that this was a theatrical experience for audiences. Um, we don't want to go too much into what the deal was, but you definitely bring up a good point that um, with, with Ted going over there and, and his staff, like, they're filmmaker friendly, they're artist friendly, and um, that makes our clients feel so much more comfortable working at a company like Amazon, where the deals may be a little bit dubious and you're not quite sure what you're getting into and you're paving new, new ground, but it makes them feel good that, um, that Ted's in charge. And I mean, it's interesting, if you guys have probably ordered from Amazon before, um, you know, which, which, what an added incentive for us to go with them is that when they send you a package, the package could be wrapped in that film sort of marketing. So there's different ways that marketing and, and these companies are reaching audiences and it's really innovative and it's exciting. And for agents, uh, we're excited for the future. Sure, there's fewer movies being made and Hollywood's only making the big blockbusters and whether you like them or not, it's a different story. But there's, there's I think, more opportunity for, for storytellers, for writer directors. Um, it's a very exciting time. Just, I, I think it's, a, what, just because we're talking about Amazon, it might, to, to use that as a, one example of a, several others that are happening, just in where, where uh, we can see content coming from. And there's going to be a lot of financiers that are coming up, and, and they'll probably disappear just like film financiers. 
But what you're seeing is Amazon, Yahoo, Apple TV is going to get into original content. You have companies like Red Bull that are creating an app for a bunch of unscripted and now scripted content. Snapchat got in the original content game. Xbox, they, they got, now got out. And what you're, and, and Amazon has, has said this, they're not, it's not a business that's self-sustaining within itself. They're essentially marketing wings of larger companies. And um, Amazon in particular is a, is, a, is a customer rewards program for Prime. They can spend that money because they have such a huge market cap that it brings people to what their core business is. I think it'll be interesting to see where Netflix goes because it is a, it is a business that is reliant on creating some form of grab each month. There's got to be a new series, a new season, something each month for someone to justify paying however many dollars a month their subscription is. But for Microsoft and for all these companies, it's not the money. Um, they're, willing to, uh, they're willing to make any deal to attract the best because it's not necessarily about... It, it, what it's about for them is just um, bringing people... Uh, that have you know a higher income, higher uh, higher net, uh, higher education. All these people that are better customers onto their platform, so they're buying elevated content. That's why when Jeff was saying premium content is king, it's, it also grabs the eyeballs for advertisers that are going to have or that are going to purchase whatever the, purchase whatever the higher higher value products are. For for Amazon, for other things, it really is about it really is about just giving people money and telling that they can do their passion project within me within a certain reason. Well, so it's also a way for them to, to tell their own story because uh, when Netflix decides to do House of Cards, it colors Netflix in a certain way and it will associate House of Cards, all the tone of the show, the themes that are and the actors with Netflix, which is not it's a, it's a big deal. This is also why they picked up Brad Pitt. Um, Amazon is doing is doing something a little bit different and at some point you will have people being able to say, okay, this is a show more for Amazon, this is a show for Netflix Netflix, as they were saying, this is a show for HBO or this is a show for mm -hmm. uh, cable television. You have to speak in the microphone, otherwise it's not recorded. I mean, we're so. also responsible. And it, it can come in any form. I mean, there's obviously television divisions and film divisions, and they're very separate, but um, they're not view they, on their side as buyers, they're not viewing storytellers as filmmakers or television people. They're viewing people as well, I said, suppose simply storytellers, not TV people or film people. The prime example is is Woody Allen. I mean, they just said, you know, they um, that was something our company did as well. He's doing a television series, not a movie for them. Um, in other regards, Netflix is giving multi-picture deals to the Duplass brothers, which you mentioned before. So it's um, it really is about you know, here's, we want to work with you in what capacity can we work with you in giving that creative freedom in order. And I think it's just on, we're just on the cusp now of that license being being able to be even more inventive in the type of storytelling that we're we're able to see. So while John is talking, if there's another question, please raise your arm. What's really exciting for audiences uh, with the advent of Netflix, and this is really coming off the heels of what HBO started with. You know, one of the things I hated working at a broadcast network, and I know the audience hated, um, and it's still a problem with the broadcast networks is, is they, they put all this promotion behind their new drama series, their new comedy series, and they get canceled after two, three episodes, right? Or after one season. They get cut because of the financial uh, ramifications they have of, of underperforming ratings. Audiences can't find shows like they used to anymore. So the great thing about Netflix is because they're making that investment in a series and they're going to produce that whole series, now audiences can find their way in all the rest, and they can consume it like they can. Just like you said that films are like the new operas, you know, these series where you can watch 13 episodes over a weekend, that's kind of like a novel, right? It's the new novel. You can immerse yourself in that for as long as you want, and then buy the next novel, which is like the next oh, wow. season. That's really what it is. Which is great, because it takes us back to our core. The thing is, it's, uh, well, I'll, um, I'll comment on that comment, because the wonderful thing about novels is that binge-watching isn't anything new. The novel was the binge watch of the late 19th century because novels were rare and uh, the stories were episodical magazine, uh, uh, on weekly magazines. Uh, that's how Three Musketeers came out and that's how Sherlock Holmes came out. And uh, whenever a, a series came to its conclusion, it would be a premium product for the publisher to, uh, to publish a novel. 
So we have time for a last question in the audience. Is there any question? No one? Questions, maybe, but there's only one that will be taken. No? Yes, here in the front. I would, uh, hello, I would go a bit back to the last topic about uh, the definition of, of games and, and movies. And uh, you said before that uh, there, the main difference is that in one, the producer takes you through the story and, and uh, he will tell you the story. And in games, you tell the story. I, I would argue on that in a sense that in most of the good games, actually, there is a story uh, written by the producer. And for example, uh, Assassin's Creed, uh, this game you've heard probably, uh, there's a, it's, a huge, it's a huge story. The whole time you're going through real episodes of historic uh, moments through human history. Uh, you are just, it's, for me, it doesn't make it like a big difference. It's kind of like 3D. You're, you're doing, you're trying out different things, but you go through the same story that the producer actually tells you. And the end, end call is still written by the producer. And for me, the difference well, is... Well, but there is branching, though. You can make choices in between the game. You, you, you can replay the game and make different choices and end up on the same spot, but not have the same journey. And it's the case for Assassin's Creed. It's called what we call in video game branching. You create different paths that are leading in the same direction. I would say it's just more interactive. Okay. <laughs> yes, well, we have time for, for the last question here in the front, and then we'll have to wrap up this panel. Hello, um, Michael, a producer, content developer for multiple platform from Germany. I have a question regarding virtual reality um, and financing it. So I was wondering, um, when it comes not to games, but to film, like 360 or not, um, you know, film, uh, you know, financing, there is no traditional, you know, distribution that far that could finance that kind of film. So it's probably hard to get or to attract talent. Um, because it's really hard to finance a film like that. And it's obviously, I guess, a little bit more expensive, even if you have to consider that the set has to be 360. Um, if you shoot in real, uh, in reality, and at the same time, um, you probably want to use existing uh, franchises. So that the question is also, you know, can you, or do you think that it's possible that you combine traditional like shooting for the like cinema uh, or other with uh, like for virtual reality or how this is going to uh, go? Um, I'll, I'll pass it off to you because I know you want to say something. I, um, they're coming out with increasingly higher def, larger headsets that aren't keyboards. Right now a lot of the things are you slide in your phones into these little cardboard things and you watch it. But, but there's, the headsets are $100, $200. And it's very expensive and it's not profitable right now. VR is, is it's very difficult to, to monetize. But I think that there's an expectation that if you are someone spending 100 to 200 dollars on a headset, that you're probably capable of spending five dollars on content. And if there's two million headsets out there and there's not that much content, then two million people are going to buy five dollar things. And if you can make something for 15 million dollars, which is a short form little short, then you've you can monetize it very quickly. And I think next year you're going to see, as long as there's not a saturation as the t of the type saturation of the amount of available shorts out there in VR. Um, I think that the, at least the best content or the content created by name brands are going to be very profitable. There are already efforts to make feature length films in VR. Um, and Verse, the company I was talking about, is, is uh, well into that already. You just look at the, talk about the saturation um, and making sure it's premium content. Look at, um, look at 3D, you know. I, what was the film that made it sort of repopular again? And then every film had 3D, you know? Now, it's pretty much only reserved for movies like The Martian and, and, and experiences where you can really immerse yourself and, and appreciate the 3D technology. So we'll wait to see the, the rush of, of VR storytelling and see if the, con if, you know, if, if the quality is high. We hope it is. Um, and um, we hope the high-level people, showrunners, writer, directors, are gravita ra gravitating towards it. We think that they are. So. Uh, just, just a comment before I, I leave the, the, the floor to you, John. Uh, since you're European, you're from Germany, you also have access with VR. When you shoot in VR, you have access to the regular uh, film funding, but you also have access to the tech 
funding. For example, DGO6, and, and it's possible. I, I just did it. I got money for R&D for a VR project. And uh, of course, they didn't pay for the shooting, but they pay for the equipment because it's not standardized. Uh, there's no standard yet. If you want to shoot in VR, you have to, to make your own gear and your own rig and everything. And for that, you can have R&D money. But it's a unique opportunity. It's a window that is opening now and will soon be closed. Yeah, for R&D, definitely, um, you know, to build a machine, yes, um, but, you know, um, if you want to deliver and produce content, R&D is not appropriate, you, you won't get, and for traditional f film funding, they would require distribution, and so far, there is but no... But you could create distribution with R&D money, yes, and you, new yes. platforms, new way of distribution, new apps, uh, this, this could work. John? So remember before I talked about how it's traditional media, branded advertising technology, so... You've got the story you want to tell, right? You have a story you think will live in the VR space, and it's an immature space at the moment. Who wants that space to mature? Who wants that space to grow? It's the tech companies, and the tech companies are getting venture money to create things. So go to, and the tech companies aren't storytellers. They just provide the tools for storytellers. So go to those tech companies and say, here's a film that I think really showcases your technology, and then have them bring the funding. Talk to them about that. That's what I did early in the mobile space, and it was very successful. And then obviously leveraging the governments and things like that. And I did a lot of that in Canada and things of that nature. But I think that's, those are the people that wanted to succeed. Technology companies need storytellers to showcase the content they're creating and developing. And it's product placement 2.0. Uh, I mean, uh, Red was doing it with their cameras. In the beginning, when you wanted to shoot with Red, you went to them and you said, Peter Jackson did it. He yep. said, oh, let, right. let me use your camera, and I will do a short film with it. Having seen the Syrian refugee camp, I, I would rather donate money to create a VR experience that showed people what it was like to then have more donations afterwards. So it, it, it can come in the charity space. It, it, the model is going to be varying completely, but I think your comment's absolutely right. There's going to be a lot of venture money coming into, into development. Thank you. The, oh, Yuri, you want a conclusion, so of course. I just wanted to add uh, something speculative and adding to the venture ca capital coming in from tech companies, there's going to be a whole other branch of tech companies coming in to play, which is the uh, autonomous cars companies. Because people are going to have to do something other than driving in the one, two, three hours of commute they'll do in their autonomous car. <laughs> Watch out for Volkswagen. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you for this panel. Thank you to the speaker. Thank you to the crowd. Everything is recorded. You can rewatch it. And thank you to the festival for inviting me. Thanks.